Hello, and welcome to the Slate Political Gap Fest for December 9th, 2020, the 15th anniversary edition. We are live on Facebook and YouTube. We wish we were live in a theater somewhere, but we're in our living rooms. I'm David Plotz of CityCast. I'm at home in my living room in Washington, D.C. I am joined by, by, by my beloved, beloved co-hosts of all these years from New York City, John Dickerson of CBS's 60 Minutes. Hello, John. Hello, David. And from New Orleans, and yet she's found a yet another new, a new place to go, not a new haven, a New Orleans, Emily Bazelon of Yale University Law School and the New York Times Magazine. Hello, Emily. Hello, John and David. Did you guys get your Trump pardon in the mail today? I got mine. That's great. Uh, what crime would you be uh, guilty of that you would need pardoning for? Uh, I think, as we'll discover in the course of the show, it's probably sanctimony and stupidity. What about you? <laughs> uh, Luckily, I thought those I, are not in the criminal statute. Yeah. Um, I uh, let's see. What would it be? Um, um, I don't know. Maybe some petty larceny. You know, just to spice up the day. Emily. Uh, you don't have let's to. See. It's okay. <laughs> You're no, on the record. Greed, no, avarice, impatience, vanity, <laughs> um, irritation. Uh, do you know uh, charity, chastity, prudence, and hope? Um, that uh, my mother had this. I'm sure I've said this on the show before. My mother had this friend who was the youngest of three uh, girls. The first girl was named Faith. The second hope was named. The second one was named Hope, and the third one was named Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> <Get up. laughs> anyway, someone came to their senses. Uh, so we are at our quinceanera. It's it, the fifteenth anniversary. Is the crystal anniversary, which is appropriate because we, on the Gab Fest, we try to be clear and sharp like Crystal, and we break Crystal when we occasionally hurl it at each other, as even happy families do. But tonight we're here to celebrate, hopefully not too self indulgently the longest and most satisfying venture, at least of my professional career. Um, week after week after week, the three of us show up in studios, on stage, on Zoom, to have a conversation among dear friends. And it we began podcasting. The year podcasting was coined, apparently. We were brought together by our former colleague and godfather of Slate Podcasting, Andy Bowers. We are still joyfully here. And I'm so glad to be here with you guys for a night of nostalgia for a nostalgia trip. Oh yeah, we are, we're happy to be with you too. We're thrilled so, and we look forward okay, to yeah. someday. It sure seems like it. Sure, sure seems and like our happy about it. audience actually in person. <laughs> yes, so we're tonight we're gonna, it's gonna be sort of a normal structure. We're gonna reminisce about some of our favorite Gap Fest moments, some issues that have obsessed and fascinated us and about what we learned from each other. Then apparently there's a surprise video. We don't know what it is, but there's gonna be a surprise. And then we will do some cocktail chatter. Plus, we're going to take your questions live. So wherever you're watching this, you can put your questions directly in the chat, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and, and we will pick them up and get some of them. So we're also doing something special for this 15th anniversary special show, which is that we have a partner, the Winemaker, the winemaker Series. And we're going to be tasting three carefully selected wines from Round Pond Estate, one for each segment of the show tonight. And we are really happy that hundreds of you are going to be able to taste those wines from home along with us. And for those of you who did not get a chance to pre-order your wine in time for the show, you can try the same three wines for yourself at a special post-show discounted price. And you, if you stick with us, we will tell you how to do that later in the show. And so, my, now, uh, Hold on. I'm just going to... My dear brother just sent me a picture of his three wines um, lined up in front nice. of his computer. Yeah, which I guess nice. is where he always always has his three wines lined up in front of his computer. But oh, tonight there. for that brother. Yeah, yes, exactly. So Round Pond Estate wines are artfully crafted by winemaker Thomas Rivers Brown. And Round Pond is an ultra premium Cabernet Sauvignon producer, which specializes, excuse me, in expressive wines, artisan foods, and unforgettable experiences in the heart of Napa Valley. So if you're tasting along at home, we're gonna start with a white wine. It's a Rutherford Sauvignon Blanc, which I'm gonna pour from over here. Here I go, off mic. Let's 
Did we pick up those glugs, Joss? And the interesting thing about this wine, they say, is that they pick the grapes at three different times during harvest, which means that there are three different levels of ripeness in the same bottle, which adds complexity to the wine. So it's like having a blend of three wines all from the same kind of grape. All right. Yum. I had, I've been, the second bottle we're going to get to, I've drunk most of in the past 24 hours. So this one, I think, is <laughs> crap. Yeah. So let's this get started. Was, this Go was ahead. my breakfast wine. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk about what's happened over 15 years, some of which what happened on the show and some of which just happened in the world. So I want to talk with a really big and probably the most serious piece of the night, which is what has changed? We are a political show. John, what has changed in politics? What are the fundamental things that have changed in politics from the time we started this back in, in 2005? Can we, just before we get into the, the serious, can we just for a moment paint the picture of what the first room was in which we did the show? So for briefly. those of you at home, yeah, briefly. So imagine you have a TV tray. That's the size of the desk on which we had these three microphones planted. And they were in a conference room, which I've said it before, I'll say it again, was the saddest chair museum in America. It had it like 30 different chairs. Somebody better than leaving them. Wow. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was your disembodied voice coming in. It had 30 <laughs> different chairs and all of them in their last exhausted breath before they totally collapsed. And that's where we did the show for uh, years, right? Anyway, that's that's what's changed in politics. Um, it feels like, because I spent so much time thinking about the presidency, so, I mean, we've learned that so much is was part of an agreement. And that agreement required everybody to kind of agree to it. And it turns out the power of that agreement can be um, challenged across so many different areas um, and that it doesn't just take one uh, president who chooses to to um, not heed to that agreement, but that you can have an entire party, which once was the standard keeper of a lot of those agreements, um, uh, not uh, think that they mean so much anymore. And that, you know, all the rules that I covered when I first came to Washington in 1995, so many of them are up for grabs and are being redefined. And, and we're about to head into an amazing period of redefinition, or maybe not. But um, uh, so I guess the just the, the, the extent to which so much was an agreement and, um, and how that has been revealed. You, this is interesting, because I, I mean, Emily, I'm gonna ask you sort of the legal end of that. But can I take can before I ask you that can I actually, because John, you took approach it from the vector of the presidency, I'll approach it from the vector of sort of the citizenry, which I, is that I feel like um, Jonathan Rausch had this wonderful piece, he's an Atlantic writer, maybe five years ago, where he pointed out a really significant number of Americans didn't believe in politics anymore, that they fundamentally didn't trust the process that was politics, the idea of compromise, the idea that they were you negotiated in partnership with a, with a, a loyal opposition and people gave some and got some, uh, because there was so, what had happened was that there was uh, so much cynicism about the system because people were doing, like their lives weren't great, um, but also people had just become divided from each other, that you you so consumed, you so lived in a world of people like you, that people who were not like you had become quite threatening and alien and and in some cases, you know, not worth, not equal to you, not, not legitimate. And I think when you have citizens, when you have a, and that, that when Rausch wrote the piece, I think he was saying it was like 30% of Americans. I think today you'd probably pull it and you'd find a much higher percentage of people who basically don't believe in the political compact. And when you have a huge, and most of those people are on the right, not all of them, but most of them are on the right. And when you have that much distrust in the political system, I, I just don't see how it can operate in the long term. Emily, do you want to take it from a legal perspective? Like, what do you think the biggest shift is that there? I'm, I mean, I'm not sure the biggest shifts are legal, actually. In some ways, I don't think you know, we've had huge things happen. I mean, we had the legalization of same-sex marriage, enormous change for civil rights and changes in people's lives that are very real. 
When you think, though, about the kinds of political divide you're describing, though, I don't actually think it's the laws that have changed. I mean, this has become a cliche to trot out at this point about the Trump presidency, but it's really the set of norms when you talk about agreement and social compact. I wonder, though, so when we started the show in 2005, George W. Bush was president, correct? That is a true fact. Correct. Okay. Yes. Uh, and yes. and ladies and gentlemen, reading political analyst of the age, Emily Basla. It's just amazing the things I get wrong. Uh, so, um, and when you think about going back to George W. Bush's presidency, I do wonder how much the fact that these sort of norms of agreement of like the rules of the road still appearing to operate was masking some actually very deep divisions. I mean, when you think about, you know, the the the, uh, the Iraq war, the abuses, the torture that took place at that time, the deep divisions over um, whether to do anything about inequality and poverty, which were beginning to be bigger problems then. Then I start to wonder if there's actually more of a continuum and it was just that people observed niceties more on each side. And so we didn't see it. I mean, I'm not sure I myself agree with that thesis. But let's put it out there for a moment. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, can't you have both? I mean, in other words, you can have one set of roiling problems that are bigger than we knew, and then you can have the death of, of agreement and norms. Um, and they're connected, but um, they don't, um, I think they can both, they can both exist. Um, I think the power to blow through a lot of those norms, the propulsive force behind it is the um, the connection that those who felt upset with the political system, the connection they felt to, to President Trump and still feel to him, um, is, is in part, surely must be in part inflamed, although then we can get into a conversation about why there's the adhesion to President Trump that there is, but is inflamed by some of those issues that you are arguing perhaps were, you know, thundering beneath the surface, but that weren't as much of our, our public dialogue, although they were, they were kind of part of our public dialogue, but. I mean, sometimes right. I think it's a difference in degree and right now it feels like a difference in kind. I mean, I don't think the, out, well, the outgoing Bush administration did not behave in this fashion. It was different, um, right? Cause it wasn't the end of a one term presidency when President Obama became president, this I feel certain of, and you're nodding affirmatively. But so in that sense, it's different. But it's still, I just can't imagine those politicians, those elected officials, those appointed officials behaving in this way. And so this moment does feel like a different in kind. And yet there are ways in which I think the Republican Party was stoking the division. It just didn't quite understand how big the embers were that then have burst into flame. Yeah. I mean, this is this goes back to the David Plotz's favorite thesis, which is that the most important election of our lifetimes was in 1992 and George H.W. Bush should have won and that would have potentially prevented the Republican Party from going in this disastrous direction. But we can save that for another year. Um, I want to talk about uh, something that's near and dear to me, which is something that we've changed our thinking on because of each other. And I, uh, I'll, let me go first on this because I have something queued up. Um, I've been listening back to some of our favorite bits, Jocelyn pulled some of them. And I wanna play this incredible moment back from 2014. I actually think this is the greatest moment in GapFest history. And it's, uh, I'm embarrassed at myself and incredibly impressed at Emily. And it's, uh, I was completely wrong. She was absolutely right. And I learned a lot and it's stuck with me. And so it's, it dates back to 2014. And the backstory is that a woman named Deborah Harrell had been arrested for endangering the life of her daughter. She worked at McDonald's. Her daughter had played on a laptop at McDonald's while her mom worked. Then the laptop was stolen. And the daughter asked if she could play on a playground instead. So the mom gave her daughter a cell phone and let her play on the playground. And while this child was playing alone, another parent saw the daughter and called the cops. So we discussed this and we started off by agreeing. We all felt rage at the situation and we talked a bit, but we pick up this clip right now as I was commenting that the playground wasn't the worst option for kid to uh, be there for. The clip is about five minutes long. So bear with it because I, I think it really, you know, Emily, congratulations. <laughs> it doesn't seem like the worst place to leave right. somebody better than leaving them indoors without. Yeah. 
or not around have other looked, people. Have we looked at the statute in, in in South Carolina about whether it would have been endangerment to leave her home alone all day? Well, the statute in South Carolina, like the statute everywhere, is very vague. It's yeah. about, you know, being reasonable, uh, providing reasonable supervision under the circumstances, which is always what these laws say. So, like, if you leave, you know, I have definitely left my 11 year old home for some amount of time. And what the jokes about, well, how much, how far long could that last for before you get in trouble? There's no answer to that question because it's all very discretionary from the point of view of the state. We don't really need to get to this because it's been made, the point has been made. But one reason why everyone's so outraged is, oh, what if the child had been abducted? And of course, we just have to point out there are so few stranger abductions in this country, as you as you might as well say, none. There are not none, but there are just so few. One, someone calculated that if you leave a child alone in a car, the child would have to wait there for 750,000 years before the child would be abducted by a stranger. So this is where it well, gets no, back it's to so the- much more. Right. It's so much more dangerous to drive around with your kid in the car just based on the number of car accidents than it is to leave a child alone in the park. Doesn't this go back to Emily's original point about race and class, which is that it's not the thing itself for which the mother was arrested, but it was it was tip of the iceberg. So if the kid's being left alone in a park all day, then untold horrible other things are a part of her life, too. But that sign of you don't have discreet negligence that it's Can we also say. What person called the police on oh, this kid? Oh, like, no, no, no. This is, on. oh, good. This is where we're going to have a fight. This is so awesome. My feeling this about is that awesome. person, whoever he or she is, was that you could ask with concern what's going on, and then maybe you try and help. How is calling the police helping oh, instead of totally like wrong. maybe seeing oh, if oh, there's some way Emily, you could help supervise this is or where there's some smug, other private resolution This is resolution where your smug you self-righteousness offer. ends. Because <laughs> I, I wanted to pose this question to you guys. You are, Let's say you go to a playground. You go there in the morning with your child. You go there. You, you hang out. You see a kid playing alone. You go back at lunchtime. You left something at the park. You go back, check. Oh, the kid is still there playing alone. There's not really doesn't seem to be attached to any adults. You go back in the evening. The kid is still there playing alone. It is would be bizarre, bizarre in this world not to ask yourself questions about this child. Yeah. Well, bizarre I didn't say not, not to, to talk to the child David. and bizarre when the child either. tells you her mom is at work or is vague about it, not to think like, maybe I have a responsibility yeah. to do something. Well, there's a middle call ground. call the police, David. That's the, call, the part that I'm arguing what, with. I am with you, you up go, until what, that. You, to try to you talk assume, to the parent to see what's well, happening. No, okay, you assume help? that the police are, you assume the police are, I assume in this society, maybe I'm wrong, the police are kind of the good guys. They're going to help sort it out, make sure the kids Why are Why do you assume that? Well, I tell my what, children never to you? speak to the police if they can possibly oh avoid God. it. The police oh cause trouble. Oh my oh God, God. <laughs> that is the most interesting thing I've ever learned. No, I'm really completely serious about that. The police are, you treat the police with the utmost care and you try to keep them as far away from your life as you possibly can. That's so interesting, Emily. That is what? so interesting. That's how That's I feel about it. Lie, you show. lie to the police. When the police <laughs> we have to have a show on that, at, on that entire uh, subject. I do not think in a situation where you are worried about an unsupervised kid that calling the police is any kind of wise move unless you think there is evidence of oh. criminality. Oh, in my danger. God. If you think a kid is being abused, that you might a, call the police. So the reason that I felt so sure that calling the police was a really poor choice for dealing with that kind of incident was all the reporting I've done in cities where people where things go wrong when people call the police. So I can remember whose face I was thinking about when I said all of that. And the reporting I've done since then has only borne that out. And of course, not in that clip, but elsewhere in that show, we talked about race and the fact that when people, when white people call the police on black people, that obviously tends to be particularly egregious and harmful or has a higher risk of turning out that way. And that is a lesson we have learned over and over again in the years since. I, 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 I have no idea what I was saying. I think I was speaking in voice for you about some earlier point you'd made about race and class. Because when I heard what I said, I thought, huh? Anyway, so you, whatever point you made earlier was good enough that I was repeating it. Um, anyway. I'm, you know, I'm deeply embarrassed by what I said and uh, how condescending and obnoxious I was. Uh, although that condescension and obnoxious this, I guess, is part of the show. Um, but man, you were right, Emily. I'm sorry. You were absolutely right. And I was wrong. And uh, I'm glad I listened to you sometimes. We- so, 
Are there, are there anything that you <laughs> so guys I'm going to change the subject to something that yeah. I was wrong about or that I learned from you, which is that early in the reporting on campus sexual assault, I was much more taken with getting the stories of victims, especially women, and not thinking very much about the rights of people who are accused and particularly making sure that you've done everything you can as a reporter to find out the other side of the story, even if you don't think it's right that you've gone to the person who's accused of assault and make sure that they have a chance to respond. Um, and David, you impressed that on me, both on the show and also as the editor of Slate. And I feel deeply grateful to you for that because I think it saved me from mistakes I might have made. Um, and obviously, the you know story that unraveled at UVA, whatever that was later in the middle of all of that, was the biggest example. I like to think I wouldn't have been that reporter without you, but you definitely helped make sure I was not that reporter. So thank you for that. Thanks. And this is why these guys are so great to be with and think with out loud and why it's always been so great to have an audience that mostly, <clears throat> I'd say super, super, super high percentage of our audience um, and certainly 100% of our devoted audience allows, you know, the fumbling, um, occasionally, pretty occasionally overheated uh, debate, um, you know, to allow, to exist. Um, without, uh, you know, allows room for all of that. And that's that's why it's so great to have these debates with you two. Uh, what are the qualities? So we, th th those were mentioning things like that. Well, let me start that over. I want to mention two qualities that uh, I admire in each of you. Quali favorite quality in each of you. Um, my favorite quality in you, John, is that uh, as, a, as a gab fester, not as a human being, but that you're very soulful. You're sneaky soulful. You're like a super soulful person. And I mean, you're a very weird person, um, which doesn't come across, I think, as much on the GabFest, but like in your life, you're like a like a really distinctive sort of your, your distinctive self. But you have a kind of like like a heart and soulfulness that is um, it's beautiful. It's like really beautiful, and sometimes it you know it's not always out on the gap fest because you're so you're also being like the keen analyst that you are and talker that you are. But it, that soulfulness is wonderful. And Emily, for you as a gap fester, not again not as you in your human human qualities uh, are, are magnificent in all sorts of other ways. But I have never met someone who is so clear about things. Like I, anything you explain, you explain, and it stays explained. It, like you start a sentence, you finish the sentence. If I start a sentence, it might or might not finish. I might go somewhere else with it. And you like, they, there's the people used to say that about Hillary Clinton, like that every paragraph made sense when she spoke. And you have that quality. It's like you, when you understand something, and first of all, you understand almost everything, but when you understand it, you explain it so well. And it's, that is rare, very rare quality to have. So thank you. No, I feel that. like John has taught me that you're supposed to be good at taking compliments and like figure out how to bask in them. And I just still have trouble, but thank you. I deeply appreciate that. Um, so my favorite thing about John on the show is the way he doesn't let us in our knee jerk way, um, <laughs> discount the counter arguments for whatever point is being made, especially if it's a political, politically or ideologically divisive point. He forces me to think about why my, you know, liberal preconceptions might be totally wrong and really think it through and like holds us to that. And I think it's because, John, you have this deeper quality of combining your analytical rigor with this really enormous heart that tends to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, but without being a chump. You know, like in the wake of Obama's book, where we're all sort of imagining an Obama that had like 15% less chumpiness, like, you know, you're sort of that person. I can't handle this. Okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay it back to both of you, even though I know you have one more for David. But um, so Emily, back to you, watching you um, report and particularly on the things you report about and the way you do, you know, I, fall, I go around a lot of places. I spend a lot of time on the road. I, you know, interview a lot of people, but, um, I just, you're 
watching you report is a marvel and having, you know, over the years talked to you about the things you're reporting and listened to you wrestle with these things and the number of calls you make and the places you go and the people you care about um, and telling the story is just, it's a really, that's what I was trying to say uh, when we were on Colbert is, you know, in my other life, I, I think about the way you report and it makes my work, I hope better, or at least it tells me how I'm not doing it as well. And, and David, there is a kind of question I ask now, and I think the kids at the dinner table know this is when to stop listening to me, but it's um, something I hold <laughs> like central to my career after 2005 when I came to Slade and when we started this, which is thinking about questions and questioning things in, in just like this whole other way than I ever did before in the previous 15 years of journalism before I came to Slade and, and, and met you. And turning questions around in that way, you know, in sort of like a Rubik's Cube is, which I do, you know, I do a lot now, um, is uh, it totally all comes from you. I mean, I'm, there's other people too, but I associate stop, it. Stop playing your head. Yeah. Just leave it with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to add about David that David makes the show by being willing to say things that most people are, are afraid to express out loud because they might be totally wrong or they might really offend someone. And without the crazy uncle buying Bitcoin, um, which I think was your phrase on TV last night, like the show loses all of its provocative edge. And it's it's not easy, like you have taken a lot of criticism over the years for things that you've said, but without that willingness to get out on a limb and sometimes actually saw it off, uh, the show is just so much less interesting and urgent and sticking in with people during the week because you make us, again, it's like about making sure the arguments are solid, but you're you're just willing to take chances that we, um, we only tentatively venture after you, and it's essential. All right. Let, before we move on from this segment, I want there's one other um, bit. If we've, we've gotten all sentimental, and it's nice, it's really nice to be sentimental, actually. But well, we should probably just, move on. Pretty soon, yeah, right? We'll move on. We'll move on. But let's just we'll play one. Right? We'll play one bit. Uh, so one of the things that we started doing, kind of as a throwaway, was a conundrums show. I'm not even sure. We just kind of started to do it because we had to fill in a week around Christmas and we didn't want to tape during that week. And so we just needed something we could tape in advance. And we started doing conundrums, which, you know, the, the archetypal one is, would you rather be a fish or a tree? Um, to which and, the obvious answer is dolphin. Yes, okay. <laughs> all right, not again. Still, okay. all these years later. And so, the, in, and we took to inviting really great guests on our conundrum show, which we would do live. And, and uh, we had so many wonderful people who've come on including Simon Doonan, who is a, I would describe as Simon as being like the professionally the best uh, dinner party companion there is, but he's a author, columnist, TV host, uh, creative ambassador. Um, and the conundrum Gosh, that we're yeah. gonna listen to now is, was would you really rather live under anarchy or under a totalitarian, or, or under a totalitarian regime, asked Joseph Murphy. So let's listen to that. It's about three minutes long. Maybe we don't have that. I guess we don't have that clip. Okay, let's keep going. He just uh, said it super quietly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we apologize. We're obviously having some technical difficulties, so uh, we'll just keep. Let's just keep going. Bear with we, us. We won't be technical difficulties. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, segment two, and. As we move on to our segment two, I'm going to move on to the second wine in our pack, which is the 2017 Left Bank Blend. And even though it's the Left Bank, people from both sides of the aisle can enjoy it. In Bordeaux, Left Bank means that the wine is mostly Cabernet Sauvignon, balanced with Merlot. Right Bank means mostly Merlot, balanced with a little Cabernet. So Left Bank wines are considered more complex and nuanced and with more character. And uh, take that for what it's worth, for what you will. So I'm going to pour that. I actually already had like 90% of this bottle, so I'm just gonna pour what's little left in it. It's delicious. Yeah, it's, I, I, I poured some for Anne, but. Really, 
lovely wine. Best line I'd had in a long time and continue to have. Um, wow, it's really, really good. <laughs> so, um, Jocelyn, do you think our video is going to work that you have queued up? Okay. We're, so we, next thing is uh, is a surprise for us. So over 15 years of weekly shows, um, we always look forward to talking to each other. And that is amazing that after 15 years, we still want to do that. But we also, uh, come from time to time, there are things that we do not feel expert to talk about. We do not feel <laughs> capable of talking about. And even as smart as John and Emily are, that there are things like that the whole not rest of the world me about. So we have been lucky enough to have some great, brilliant, delightful guests on the show to help us out. And apparently, part of celebrating our 15th anniversary is celebrating with them. So there has been a secret surprise for us, I am told, and we're going to sit back, enjoy our wine and the little surprise and see what happens. We don't know what's going to happen. Hi, Emily, John, and David. Oh, you know, when we created the Gab Fest 15 years ago, my motives were entirely selfish. I just loved it when the three of you would debate politics on the weekly Slate editorial calls, and I wanted to create a show that was nothing but that. So I set up a few mics in a room and let you guys loose. Now, uh, I don't think any one of us would have possibly imagined that a decade and a half later, I and your legions of other fans would still be able to get together with you every week around your virtual table. You have talked us through elections and scandals. You have talked us through great times and some really truly awful times and what I hope are gonna be some great times again on the horizon. You inspire and influence an entire new generation of podcasters. And you've shown that there's a place for conscience as well as pragmatism in a discussion of politics. It's going to sound a little corny, but you've actually made the world a better place. So thank you for making my selfishness pay off so handsomely over these 15 years. Congratulations. And here's to the next 15. One of my strongest memories ah, of my time yeah. in the slate offices in the Newsweek building at Columbus Circle are of huddling, definite huddling, with Emily in a storage closet, a literal storage closet, the only storage closet in America equipped with an ISDN line so that we could connect with John and David, who may not even have had a closet in DC, to record an early episode of the Political Gadfest. Uh, the tech was very rickety. Your producer, me, was really not up to the job. But you guys really took to podcasting from the start. You had conversations that everybody wanted to listen to uh, and still do. Over the last 15 years, a lot of things have changed. Your employers, uh, political attitudes, political norms. But you are still bringing it every week. Um, you clearly love each other dearly and really enjoy talking to each other. But you can't possibly have as much fun making it as those of us on the other end of the earbuds have listening to the show. On behalf of Slate Podcast, thank you so much for all of your work over the years of making Political Gabfest uh, 15 glorious years, and here's to many, many more. Oh, in the mid 2000s, John was in a dysfunctional work marriage. So I really remember the time right after he started at Slate where he would come through the door and he was just buoyed up, lifted up by these conversations he was having with other journalists, arguing things in good faith, chewing on intellectual ideas, doing exactly what it is he loved. And I'm sure that when Jacob hired him for that job, he didn't realize that he would be putting him in a 15 year relationship. So thank you to Emily and David for showing John what a work relationship could be. And in fact, John now uses it in the place of highest honor, which is as parental advice to the children which is to say that when you do what you love, good things will follow. So cheers to the GabFest. Congratulations, GabFesters. I'm very proud to be a part of the GabFest family. Some of my favorite memories are from when my dad would let me try and fix the GabFest topics, or when I was younger and got to go to the recording room with all foam walls. I still want my own room to have foam walls one day. Cheers to 15 more years. Hey, Emily. Hey, John. Uh, hey, David. I think, um, I was probably asked to do this because I'm one of the few people who has a Gen 1 
uh, <laughs> podcast t-shirt, which has not yet fallen apart. Uh, I think I, of course, treasure the anti-panda icon on it most of all, but I uh, enjoy the, um, the drink that is the Venn diagram center for you three. And I have to say, in my experience of hanging out with you guys around the GabFest, the uh, alcohol theme has been crucial um, for me, some of the most heartwarming part of it. Uh, and I guess what I'm thinking of mainly is hanging out with you guys the couple of times that uh, the GabFest came to Boston. And those were just incredibly fun evenings that I think were emblematic of something that you know, I love about what you guys do, which is to create a virtual community that also goes live at times. So it crystallizes in these events. And, um, you know, Dave, what can I say? You're my brother. Like we, you know, hung out forever and ever, but I love being with you in your adult world. And um, the, uh, the GabFest crew has provided like a kind of anchor to that. And also, I guess I would say it's been this great way for me to see all these other people who I meet at those events and sort of mingle with, um, for whom the GabFest has also given them some kind of adult meaning um, in their uh, virtual sense of fraternity with you. So I'm the only one who gets to claim real fraternity with you, <laughs> which I will um, by saying congratulations. Um, Thank you. And you guys are awesome. Yay, I hope you have a great party. Hey, David, John, and Emily, just want to say congratulations on your 15 amazing years of the political gab fest. It's just extraordinary to think how lunchtime conversation uh, years ago in Washington, D.C., uh, when you're all at Slate, has continued to uh, flourish over all these uh, many tumultuous political times. Uh, and to see that you still enjoy each other's company is the most important part of all. And can't wait to see uh, how it continues to grow and develop and what, you, uh, what you'll what you say next. Congratulations, Emily, David, and John. Don Dickerson, you know I adore you. I just want to join the group of people, join the crowd that's saying, 15 years and still going, 15 years and going strong. You guys know a lot of marriages don't even last that long. Mine did not. But here's the question. Who doesn't enjoy smart, thoughtful, intelligent conversation? Nobody I know. There is a reason why the three of you were voted favorite political podcast by the Apple Podcast listeners. You know what that is? You guys know your stuff. And you always give us, those of us who are listening to it, you always give us something to think about. That's always a good thing. So I just wanted to raise a glass. Listen, I want to raise a trophy to you, a trophy <laughs> in your honor. Continued success, cheering you on always. Congratulations and bravo. Hey, Emily, John, and David. You know, 15 years ago when you started the GabFest, many of us thought a podcast was something you put on a broken foot. But today you've spawned an army of imitators and we the imitators and your loyal listeners owe you a big fat debt of gratitude for 15 years of smart, incisive political gab. Congratulations, my friends. Here's to many more. Hi, David and John oh, and goodness. Emily. Congratulations on 15 years. Thank you for always being so smart and interesting and funny and making sense of the confusing political world. Um, when I listen to you, I feel like um, we're all having this, you know, very witty, insightful conversation, even though I'm the one listening and you're the ones speaking. Um, but actually one time I got to be part of the conversation when I was on stage with you in St. Paul, which I remember very fondly, and I hope someday we can all be together again. Congratulations. For my chatter, I want to talk about my cocktail of choice, the Slate Political Gab Fest, 15 years old this week. You can think of Emily as the gin, John as the vermouth. Emily, your voice burns a little, but it's that <laughs> delicious burn, a little angry, cutting through all the crap. And John, you offset it with soothing reason, my weekly reminder that decency still exists and can even prevail. David, you shake the drink, and boy do you shake it. I feel like David adopted a persona for the show that somehow became his real personality. And now I can't remember what his real personality needs to be like. The alchemy of the Gab Fest is how perfectly it comes together. 
So I'll be chattering this weekend about how much I admire and adore the three of you. I used to be your boss. <laughs> now, I'm just your biggest fan. Emily, David, John. I just want to say first that I can't believe I get asked to say happy 15 years together. Um, I've only been a guest on the show one time. <laughs> Otherwise, I am essentially a glorified listener. And I got to tell you, it is a very enormous honor to be able to sit here today and say happy anniversary. Thing number two, I'm just going to say without any preamble, happy anniversary. You guys make me think, you make me laugh, you make me disagree, which is extremely healthy. It's a normal thing to do. People in the rest of the country don't think that that's valuable, but I think all of us who listen to this show really appreciate your brains and your willingness to be partners in a conversation about how to live our best, most civil lives and to understand the role of politics and government in them. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, I poured myself a drink. I got a little Japanese whiskey, even though it is not my usual Japanese whiskey hour. I'm going to raise this one to you guys. Happy anniversary, and thank you for 15 years of just y'all. Happy 15th anniversary. Really, uh, it's been an extraordinary achievement. Uh, you're a great partnership, and you've provided a lot of wit and wisdom and insight into American politics over all those years. Thank you, and have a great celebration. Hello, GabFest crew. Uh, happy anniversary. I wish I could be there to celebrate with you. Uh, but let's hope that uh, the next time I'm on the show, uh, we can celebrate a healthy, vibrant, uh, secure <laughs> democracy together. Oh, I can man. dream, right? Happy anniversary. Congratulations, Political GabFest, on your 15th anniversary. With a special shout out to my dear friend and law school classmate, Emily Bazelon, and to her two great co-hosts, John Dickerson and David Plotz. Hello, GabFest people. This is um, friend of the GabFest, Mark Leibovitz, checking in to wish you guys a very happy 15th birthday. 15 years is incredible staying power in the podcast world. Um, it is actually the equivalent of 307 years in regular years. I, I looked this up on the internet, so it has to be true. Uh, that makes you older than America, it makes you older than the Constitution, um, the light bulb, everything. Um, and uh, I'm in awe of what you do and what you continue to do and how you successfully seem to sell out every single vintage urban jewel of a renovated theater in America. And um, that is an incredibly impressive thing. So uh, keep doing what you're doing and I will always be a fan and I will, um, you know, I'll always be a listener and hopefully we will uh, be doing this again in 15 years, if not sooner or later. Bye. Emily, John, David, congratulations on 15 years of the Political Gap Fest. I've been a loyal listener going back to when I was in college and have been very proud to be able to participate on occasion as a guest host. Here is to 15 more years and much more success. Hey, it's John Moalem. I started listening to the Gap Fest 15 years ago. Uh, I was just starting out as a journalist and didn't know a lot of journalists in real life. And I think what happened was almost like a baby chick. I kind of imprinted on the three of you as imaginary colleagues. So I'm grateful to you for keeping me company uh, every week since while I'm doing the dishes or cooking dinner or on a long drive or a walk or in the dentist chair once I remember. Uh, this fall, uh, we've been building a lot of this fence together. So thanks a lot. Happy anniversary, Emily, John, and David. Simon Doonan here. As you can tell, I've had a facelift. I look really good, woo! Happy anniversary, woo! Hi, Emily, John, and David. It's Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. Congratulations on 15 years of podcasting. Over the last 15 years, Political Gap Fest has built such a broad audience to connect us all with politics. I was so thrilled to have the opportunity to join the podcast last year to discuss my work in Congress and the work that we're doing to help the American people. I hope that one day soon, I'll be able to join you all again in person. But until then, stay safe and congratulations on this achievement. Congratulations, Slate Political Gab Fest hosts, David, Emily, John. I, first of all, hello, hello. And I just wanna thank you for doing this show for the past 15 years. 
I've been listening every week for the last 11 years. I've gone back and listened to everything else you posted before that, and I'm just in awe of how you can make this tangled world of politics not only um, more comprehensible, but in some ways more palatable. Because when I listen to your show, not only do I learn things about things I didn't know about, but I also learn that I'm not alone in, in my concerns or my excitements about what happened this week. And you have introduced me a, to the idea of podcast. You're the first podcast I ever listened to. And I am so grateful, like so many people are, that every week we get to feel like we're the fourth person at a little four-top lunch table with three old friends talking about this critical world that we don't necessarily understand, but that you make accessible. So thank you, congratulations, and please, 15 more. Wow. That was amazing. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Justin Faith. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you, guys. You, um, you know, about halfway together. through, I started thinking, the show better not suck tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I sort of feel like now we could die happy, you know? <laughs> wow. That was an amazing amount of love. Thank you to yeah. all of all of you. An incredible oh, amount wow. of love. Very yeah. special. So, A, I was shocked that... Um, Wesley has only been on once. That's embarrassing. Oh my God, how great is Wesley's mustache though? I was completely <laughs> taken with and distracted by how great his mustache looks. I knew See, that because he wrote a great essay about it, but I hadn't actually seen it live. I mean, Emily, also, you can get, they could get Stacey Abrams to come do a cameo, but you can't get her to come <laughs> guest on a segment? I mean, come on. <laughs> we'll have to work on that. Wow. Who is there anybody is there anybody you guys can think of that you would want to be a guest on the Gabfest uh, who we haven't had? Do we really have to figure oh. that out right this second? <laughs> I don't know. Just a question. Bob Dylan. Ulysses you know, S. Grant. Good candidates. Uh, uh, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Are you guys having technical difficulties? No, no, we're just being slow to answer your question. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Well, let's move on. Let's that move was, on. Yeah, that was emotionally humbling. Powerful. That was humbling and very beautiful, and we are deeply grateful. Now I don't need to go to my own funeral or to your <laughs> funeral. Do you remember, by the way, I'm just going to cleansing breath here. Um, when uh, Sarah Palin, was, was Sarah Palin picked? And we did an emergency show because I did it from the yeah. now. What was happening? I was in an we, airport. She was picked, and, but she was. She, the news came in while we were on the show, yes. while we were taping, and, and we responded to it responded live. And we didn't know who she time. was. You miraculously knew who she was. I had never heard of her in my life. Yeah, you were great. I mean, Emily and I. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I remember I was in an airport. I guess flying to the convention. Um, I just had this vision of like being on a phone, a, a pay phone for some reason, I guess that the line was better. Anyway, that was, uh, yeah. Okay. So I, it did happen during the show. All right. Now let would, me... would have been cool to have Sarah Palin in that montage. That would have been cool, but she was never a guest. I'm sure she listens every week. All right. So let's go to cocktail chatter. We're gonna do this slightly out of order. We're gonna do cocktail chatter, which is gonna be like a regular cocktail chatter. Um, and then we're gonna do an audience Q&A afterwards. And I, I realize there's been some uh, technical snafus and I, I, we do have some questions, but we uh, apologize if you were unable to get a question in because of something that went awry technically. Um, and as we go into cocktail chat, we're gonna try our third and final wine of the night, which is a 2014 Rutherford Cab. And this is a special wine from Round Pond's library that they picked just for our anniversary. It's made from the top 5% of grapes grown on the Round Pond estate. It's been aged for six years, and they say it could age for another 10 or 15 more years before it hit, hits its peak. And the critics, who listens to the critics, but the critics say that it has complex dark fruits. And it's very intense. So we're going to pour that right now. Oh. 
Okay. Yeah, you're going to be pie-eyed by the time this is over. Yeah, totally. We sort of need it with all that emotion that we have to absorb. Yeah. So let's go to cocktail chatter. Um, each of us had a chatter we were going to share last night on The Late Show. We did The Late Show with Stephen Colbert last night as part of our celebration. Um, but the discussion got so lively around corruption and pardons that we didn't get a chance to actually do our cocktail chatter. So let's share our Colbert chatters now. John Dickerson, what is your chatter? Um, so my chatter was when I was looking up pardons and the history of pardons and going back and looking at the delicate, delicate, super delicate dance between Nixon and Ford. And um, Al Haig goes over to, who's chief of staff for Nixon, goes over to see Ford. And he's got a list of six options for Nixon about what he might do, including pardoning himself. But number six was that um, that Ford, would he be, were he to become president, would then pardon Nixon. And Ford said, you know, said, Al, I'm an interested party. I can't talk to you about this. So this is not my chatter. But Ford, when no one was watching, told Al Haig to go away. And it's just a reminder that occasionally people, when you could do something easier, they do actually the right thing. Anyway, the chatter is about on the day that Ford pardoned Nixon, about which people feel a lot more um, uh, anger towards him. That same day, Evil Knievel tried to jump the Snake River. Oh. So we think of life now as being full of like crazy crashing coincidences, but Evil Knievel tried to jump the Snake River 1,600 feet f uh, across, 500 down. And I guess I remember that, but I've forgotten what a total cock up it was. I mean, he basically, the rocket ship he was in, First of all, the whole week leading up, there were basically different newscasts about how the different kinds of ways he could die. And he sat and watched these in preparation for his um, launch. He launched and, and like seconds afterwards, the parachute de deployed, the rocket, which was on its ascent, went down into the canyon. He was fine, I think he broke his nose. Although I think in his life he got 433 fractures. Um, anyway, um, that happened on the very same day, pardon uh, Ford, uh, pardon Nixon. And there were, apparently there were, you know, a variety of different headlines. And in one, I don't know if it was in the same town, but let's just imagine it was for the purposes of this chatter that, that one newspaper's headline was Ford pardons Nixon and the, another one had a headline that read, Evil Knievel fails to die. So that was, um, that's what I came across as I was preparing to. Um, I remember watching that. I wonder if I, that's a legit oh. memory or if that's an implanted memory. I do remember watching him try to do that. By the but way, that would have been five, um, maybe. Hmm. There was a story that his first, he was, um, once when, when he started his um, daredevil career, for those who weren't alive for all of this, basically, Evil Knievel used to shoot himself forward at ramps. Some people said he was jumping a motorcycle, but essentially he wiped out so much, it was more like he was just careening into ramps and propelling himself into ramps. Anyways, when he was in construction, he tried to do a wheelie with a um, some piece of construction equipment, knocked out electricity for the whole town of Butte, Montana. So that's how his <laughs> career started. <laughs> Emily, what is your chatter? My chatter is about a coral reef in Mexico which got hit by Hurricane Delta in October and is being saved and rebuilt because it is the first natural structure in the world to have an insurance policy. So this is a story about environmental renewal that has like a total legal technical side, which makes it perfect for me. I read about it in the New York Times, the story by Katrine Einhorn and Christopher Flavel. And basically this state in Mexico called Quintana Roo, which is has um, Tulum and Cancun in it, was really worried about its coral reefs. And so it contracted with an insurance company to buy a policy that would kick in and give money back to the state if the wind speed of a hurricane exceeded 100 knots. So Hurricane Delta did exceed 100 knots. The state of Quintana Roo got $850,000 and use that money to pay for a team of volunteer divers to go down, pick up the broken pieces of the coral reef that had fallen off and paste them back on with some special paste that they created. And this is a way of rebuilding coral reefs. I guess it's like if you lose a tooth or even if you lose like a finger to be really gross, if you put it back in quickly, it can presumably regrow and regenerate. And this idea of um, having funds that comes from insurance policies could be used for 
salt marshes um, and other kinds of natural structures that that humans also need. And one of the um, reasons why the coral reef was important to the state is that it actually protects the land from surging coastal waves. Uh, and so it's not just like a beautiful structure that's important to the ecosystem of the ocean, though it is all those things and provides for lots of species diversity, but it's also integral to the structure of this part of Mexico. So I, in my, um, you know, law hat self, love the idea of an insurance policy for, um, for this coral reef. And it seems like it could be a model that other countries and states could follow. Yeah. Well, uh, my, uh, isn't, well, not to be a downer, but isn't the real problem with coral reef is just temperature hikes, which you can't really insure against, that the temperature is yeah, rising. Yeah, you can't. In the Someone brought that up in the piece. You can't insure against everything, but That's hurricanes are something that actually yeah. you can address, and they do sudden damage. Um, but you are being a dad. All right, yeah. my chatter, yeah. my chatter is an upper. So there's a great story in the Washington Post this week about how plastic surgery is having a boom year because of this perfect confluence of events. There's a people in the plastic surgery getting class are on Zoom calls, and a lot of them are unhappy with how they look. Um, and so there's a lot of people getting Botox and little face, little bits of face work because they don't like that. And then there's also this thing where you don't, since people don't actually have to be in the office or don't have to be anywhere, and in fact, or can't be anywhere for weeks at a time, you could get some serious work done and not worry about someone catching you mid recovery. So, uh, you know, there's no event to go on, no event you're gonna have to go to, no wedding you have to show up at. So you can take a few weeks, recover, and then show up with your new face or your new butt or whatever it is you're gonna show up with. And, and so as a result, there's this enormous boom in plastic surgery, which I think is very, very funny. But wouldn't you want to time it right? Like if you were going to do Botox and you you got your Botox like three months ago, you're still not seeing anyone. I feel like no, no, you would want to No, no, the Botox is for Zoom. The oh, Botox is for Zoom. Zoom. Like the boob jobs, the yeah. facelift, okay. the ass stuff. Just Whoa. fix that. I know. For, I've been uh, doing that to my face too. Yeah. Um, um, huh. Yeah. So, so we have... Uh, a bunch of you could also just hide self view on Zoom. That is a cheaper alternative that I recommend. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we have before we get into the Q and A, we're going to share an offer uh, from our sponsor, Round Pond Estate, and the Winemaker Series. They've made this show really special and for us more enjoyable than it would have been otherwise. <laughs> Gabfest fans, you can buy this three bottle tasting kit by texting Round Pond. That's one word to three five one four 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 wine. It's an exclusive offer for GapFest listeners to celebrate our 15th anniversary, and they're extending the offer for other, they're, excuse me, and they're extending the offer for holiday purchases. So these three wines are normally $224 when they're sold separately, and they're usually only sold at Round Pond Estate Winery or to club members. But the Winemaker Series is giving our listeners the chance to buy all three, try all three, for just $150, which is a great deal. Uh, and I can tell you it's been a joy drinking it for me. So we're going to take some of your questions. You can put them in Facebook and YouTube. We've got a bunch already. Um, why don't we start uh, with, we're going to start with a question that came in from Benjamin Zalisco. How much do the three of you talk when you're not podcasting? How does having so much of your relationship during a filtered, self-conscious podcast affect the nature of your relationships? That's a pretty direct question. I like to get it. We're going to be very self-indulgent this show, so let's talk about it. I... Uh, I'll, I'll go first about this. We talk, I mean, Emily, you and I talk frequently, John, you and I talk less. Um, and we, oh, but we, we did just have a lovely walk recently. We did. And we've made always when, whenever we have a chance to be together, it, cause none of us live in the same city, in the same city, we always take the time to be with each other and spend time together. And that to me has been genuinely like really important like it, it really matters and you you both came to my 50th birthday party which was like the last event before lockdown and it, it remains kind of etched in my memory because i mean it was my birthday party so i guess it would be but it was just a wonderful occasion to be together and you've both been like i mean i think uh, you know 90 percent of our conversation is on the show i suppose but it allows the 10% that isn't to, to also be warm and rich and deep for me. So yeah, I, that's a great way to put it. I, I, you know, I am, I'm so thankful to 
to have that part outside the show, even though most of it's inside the show. We also all talk to each other when we need to, right? Like we're, there's, it's like, if you, if you, if you knock, the person is there. Yeah, right. Which has its, which is like that 10% you're talking about, David, it has a, <clears throat> knowing that's there is very powerful too. Um, okay, let's do an audio question. Why don't we do a question from Alan Laird? Hello, this is Alan Laird. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the USA. And my question is for John, but it would be fun to hear from Emily and David. If you could interview anyone, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Uh, so I'd want to talk to Jesus um, and, and then pretty much just listen. Excellent choice. <laughs> Emily? Dead or alive through me. I have yeah. a good, like, alive question, and now I don't know what to say because it's so prosaic. And if you look right. at what is it? Go ahead. Well, this is not including all the dead people. This is alive people. And I guess also I didn't try to think outside the United States, but I would like to have a real, honest interview with Bill Barr, our attorney general, like a real interview where I got to find out what he was thinking. You mean the way you give him sodium pentothal or where it was off the record or well, you he mean just, just trust enough me and time. It's off the record and I, Yeah, and I get to hear like what he was really thinking and doing and like about yeah. the decisions he made. Jesus or Bill Barr? Jesus. <laughs> well, I know I that's told tough. you. That's hard. Really huh. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I got to think on that one. I, um, I mean, I'll give my prosaic answer too, which is prosaic because I always give this answer, which is Ulysses S. Grant because he's my favorite American and I just loved reading him. And so I think I would love hearing him talk. And he was such a self-aware, ironic, funny person that I bet he would have been a great, great conversation, um, conversationalist. Uh, I'm gonna continue to get questions which are about us. So from Ryan Moore, how did you three meet? How are we introduced? Because I, I remember distinctly meeting each of you in separate I remember for that too. John? So John and I started Slate in the yeah, same yeah. month. Remember? So Emily and I met at the Slate retreat in Newsweek offices in New York at some little, it feels like it was some little little bar they had set up for us or something. Anyway, in the room we were in was a conference room in which every, it felt like three feet, maybe it was four. There was a column that was the size of a VW bug. It was basically a room full of columns. And then there were little places where we would sit at tables and try to have talks. But in the talks, you had to go like this because you are always slaloming around the uh, around the columns. So I remember that we were both there at the same time, although I was writing my book. So I wasn't that was like a, I was there, but I wasn't really there. And then, David, you and yeah, I met, before you like officially started. Right. Right. And David, I think we did. We uh, whether or not we may have met beforehand, the the the, the real meeting was at the in the Bob Inglis. Uh, Ernest Holling, Ernest Fritz Holling's race in 1998 in various parts of South Carolina. Yeah, right. Yeah, we were both covered. Yeah, we covered that race. It was that was it was great. That was really important to me in all kinds of ways. Meeting you, some great stories I did came out of that. Yeah, I, that was awesome. And Emily, you and I met. We had a, a mutual friend. You don't remember this. You only remember this because I told you about this. Oh, okay. Why don't you tell the story? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Jacob hired me and then I moved to Washington where you were the deputy editor of Slate and like the whatever, uh, the Washington office, Maine Puba. And I came in and we like went out and had coffee. It was cold. You were wearing like a blue knit cap and you just seemed so skeptical of me. I just remember being really sure that Jacob had hired me and you were just like, okay, <laughs> whatever. Do you remember that office? Like it didn't have any framed anything on the wall. There was like a Israeli poster of like a carrot that was also sort of a penis. And like, do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, that was Avi Zettelman. Our intern, his dad, was a public health, a sex public health doctor, had given us that it was some Israeli STD uh, health poster. I don't, yeah, I don't know why I was there. But yeah, I walked into the um, office and at that point, there happened to be no women working out of that DC office except for the poor intern who was a little beleaguered and it, 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 uh, it, lacked, uh, it lacked a woman's touch, shall we say. Was that the office with the chair museum? 
No. Yeah. No. Yo, yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Oh, oh, my God. God. Yeah. Yeah. Was, uh, oh, God. Um, all right. Let's do a, a, just a couple more let's, as we're bringing this home. So how about uh, an audio question from Daniel Fabiano? Hi, this is Daniel Fabiano from Toronto. My question is, as listeners, we know that David and Emily and John enjoy a good metaphor, especially John. What metaphor describes how each of you prepares for an episode of the Gab Fest? Hmm. <laughs> I was hoping John would have something right. Yeah, I don't really. I don't really have. I, don't, I feel as though I'm. Um, I don't really have a metaphor for how I prepare, except for there's, I know the, the process of it, which is it starts very strong and then it peters out. And then there's a dose of panic for the last bit because I've, I thought I was on a roll and then I went and got distracted by something else. But I sometimes feel like a squirrel, like a squirrel eating nuts yes. and like chewing on them and trying to stuff them into my cheeks so that maybe I'll remember them. Yeah. That's good. That's a good one, Emily. That's good. That's like good. That. That's good. I like that. Yeah. 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 No, I like um, that. Huh. Mine. Mine is something that is more like John's, which is that I begin with really good intentions. I'm like, I'm really going to read the whole research brief this week, and then, <laughs> and then by kind of the end, I'm like, all right, how many? I must have questions that I can do just based on my own mind, without having read anything, and. But sure. You're like the Calvin of Calvin and Hobbes. Yeah, all right. I don't well fail, fail, fail. Uh, All right, one more audio question from Cynthia Lerner. Hi, this is Cynthia Lerner from Northbrook, Illinois. My question is, have you ever cried during the Gab Fest? And if yes, why? Tears mm. of joy, sadness, relief? Any kind. Thank you. I think I, I'm I sure I have I, more. I think I have more than anyone. Do you remember doing it? I don't. I do. I think I you have. I remember you doing oh. it. Really, like in the con. I mean, I remember you. Oh, right. You, I did. You were well. just outside the show. I don't think it was on the show because I was such an asshole. You know. Oh, right. Uh, we have the fake ones. I, well, I think I've gotten... Wait, this is a good segue. Okay. So, you know, when I... Yeah, I remember actually, one time... Oh, sorry, Emily. Yeah, you go. No, no, please. No, I, I remember... Well, it was once I think about my dad, I, once about Anne, once about you guys, and I think once about my kids, who actually are basically is almost a little bit older than the Gap Fest, and they actually happen to be standing behind me. So <laughs> that's one of them. Oh, Special yeah. treat. We've got the whole yeah, Dickerson family. The whole Dickerson so, family. So Hi, they Bryce and Nan. We're and just Dan. little little babies when we started, and now they're full human adults. Um. So. Yeah, and, um. So anyway, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good question about your children. Did, did Did David do that one? No, not yet. I don't think it was a good question about you all started this when you had younger children. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And how you thinking had evolved? Well, maybe he can right, ask that. That can be our last question. We all started this when we had young children. Um, all of our children have now grown up. They are guests. I have the youngest. I have a thirteen-year-old, a twelve-year-old, excuse me, and then uh, and then Emily, you and I have twenty-year-olds, or maybe your eldest is twenty-one. Um, Funny. So, but they've all grown. They've been basically gap best children. They've been, oh shit! I almost spilled my wine. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and, and I have my wine like kind of down into the right, and so when I was gesturing down into the right. Anyway, uh, what how, what has how has that how has that affected us? How, has they have they have they changed our political views? My children at this point often know more about politics than I do. Find it somewhat dismaying that anyone would listen to their mother talk about politics or really pretty much anything. But they have definitely challenged my views because, um, especially on questions of economic policy, um, 
zoning is a hot topic in my house. They um, have really taught me a huge amount. Seeing, seeing questions through their eyes, seeing and explaining things when you suddenly, or when you start seeing yourself talking through the way they would see you, or and just like that whole set of mirrors affects me a, a lot. And then also debates and discussions with them um, as they've gotten older. Um, you know, you really, <laughs> like you, you can't wing it the way you can on the show. You know, you have to, uh, you, it's a lot, it has to be a lot more buttoned up um, because they're not such accommodating um, interlocutors uh, the way you guys are. Um, and well, I also, think- they have an impatience, right? Often, like the impatience of youth and a willingness to challenge things that we've just become inured to, which is like really necessary and adds urgency. It also makes me think about the stakes, like amazingly to what they're gonna, what the world is gonna be like that they will be left, um, uh, which sometimes can be quite overwhelming. Um, when you're doing certain kinds of reporting. I mean, it doesn't happen so much when I think about what we talk about, but but that certainly affects the way uh, I look at the world now. All right, that is a wrap for our 15th anniversary celebration. I'm slightly buzzed and very uh, teary. <laughs> the Live Gab Fest was produced by Faith Smith, Jocelyn Frank and Bridget Dunlap with help from Britt Pooley. Our managing producer is June Thomas, who you saw earlier. Gabe Roth is editorial director of Slate Audio, and Alicia Montgomery is executive producer of podcast for Slate. For Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson, I'm David Plotz. Thanks for listening. We will talk to you next week.